and thank you for participating in uh, the introduction to forensic audio led by Lawrence Abu Hamdan, session number one. Um, this seminar will focus on, on, on the research and practice of Lawrence Abu Hamdan as an artist, the architectural aesthetics of sound and voice and its application to politics and law. The seminar will focus on new methodologies and novel form that can potentially be developed to respond to the prevalence of surveillance technologies. Through the exploration of listening practices, the participant will focus on forensic use of acoustics, language and phonetic dimensions of legal or political issues. The seminar will also explore the changing role of the image and its proximity to sound in the age of the internet and mass distribution of signal. And I'm going to present the instructor as well for, for those who don't know, don't know Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence Abu Hamdan is an artist and audio investigator, currently a guest at DAAD in Berlin. No more. What? I just left Berlin. Oh, I like okay. it. I like it. Sorry. So <laughs> I'm going to, I think it's better if the instructor. I can introduce you as well. Yeah. Fine. Um, yeah, sure. So uh, I'm calling you from Beirut. Uh, I'm an artist. I'm living here. Uh, I also call what I do sometimes the work of a private ear for reasons that will become um, apparent later. Um, and basically, I mean, through what we discuss and through the, the sort of cases that we kind of like um, open up, you will learn what I do. So there's not really much point me saying it right now. I mean, you'll learn it more from the kind of like, from the thinking behind it. You did watch one of the works I made, Rubber Coated Steel, in preparation for this seminar, but, um, and you, you, I will share some other pieces I've made as we go on, but mostly the point of this is to kind of like discuss with you and open up for discussion the sort of wider series of um, both kind of like theoretical, but also uh, politically strategic ways in which I think sound plays a kind of important role um, outside of simply speech politics. Um, so kind of like in parallel to speech politics. So I think that's, I'm gonna read you a, a, a short introduction. Um, uh, I could do that now actually, and then I think what would be useful is you kind of then introduce yourselves. Probably yeah. the best thing to do, right Flavio? Yeah, um, but before I think it's better if the, the, the participant introduce themselves before. Okay, fine, we go like that. Maybe, uh, you know what, it's just a short, uh, yeah, okay. Okay, do that. Uh, does anyone want to introduce themselves? Or In, if you want to speak, you have to unmute yourself. Um, I can just start over here. Uh, my name is Clemens. I'm a PhD student at Princeton University in the history and theory of architecture. And I am, I have my recent, or like not recent, but like my earlier research at Goldsmiths um, was on, um, was on the translation transformation of data into sound and visualization in the work of Roji Keda, a Japanese artist. And uh, that's how I became interested in this whole aspect of sound art and transformation and translation of data into sound and visuals and like this aspect of the process of translation or transformation and that's why I'm interested in this course. Cool. Okay. okay. Uh, hi, I am an experimental filmmaker from Mexico City. I work uh, sometimes with ethnography, <laughs> sometimes with uh, theory fiction. And recently I've started to like make the audio of my own films, which allows me to translate concepts from the visual to the sound and vice versa. And yeah, I guess that's what I'm interested in, in this class. Okay. 
Good to know. Hi, I'm Gökcan. Uh, I'm originally from Turkey, but uh, I've been in Beirut for the past 10 months for um, the Ashkan Lalwan uh, Homework Space Program, which is an independent study program, mainly for artists, but I participated in it as a writer. Uh, before this year, I have been working in Istanbul in several art spaces. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of bizarre. This is not going in a list. I'll just jump in then. Okay. Um, so yeah, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Terence. Um, I live in Berlin. Uh, I'm an artist and writer, um, and uh, my work is generally in the area of things, you know nexus between uh, biology, machine intelligence, and aesthetics. Um, I'm also quite interested in the reason I took this class is um, uh, around the conversation around what contemporary art needs to do in a you know in a post contemporary society and uh, the failures of contemporary art um, <coughs> that are kind of rife. Uh, so something like the forensic architect project uh, and Lawrence's work is um, is is what I see as an art project that functions as uh, an object of knowledge, and maybe you don't use the word object, but it's something that really functions um, in, in terms of education and, and um, the production of knowledge, and actually has some kind of traction um, outside the world of contemporary art. That's my main interest in taking the class. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I don't know who who I'm listening to. Okay, great. This is Livia. Hey. Hi. Okay, good. Uh, my name is Livia Bessa Paris. I'm doing my PhD at Plymouth University. And I'm developing a notion alongside um, architecture, forensic architecture, in the sense that I am um, inquiring on how poetics can also function as as a forensic um as some some form of forensics so this is what i've been developing i'm in my second year getting into my third and um my research itself i'm from venezuela originally and um the research has to do with erased history in venezuela and uh, particularly the disappearance of my own father. And so I am trying to find ways of, uh, through, through, of course, art-based art -based research on how to, um, to bring another side of the story to this and bring it to the public forum, which is something that hasn't been opened up in the country yet or in, in the general knowledge. Mm. Oh, one thing, I'm not a sound artist, but I'm That's really not. interested, okay, I'm really yeah. interested in the, I hate in the notion art. of attunement, <laughs> <laughs> in the notion of attunement and, and your paper, the first paper that we got, and it just opens up with that idea of how we are attuned, but also I think, yeah, yeah so that, that, that's part of my research, attunement as method. Yeah. Uh, but I put in different ways. So, Great. okay. Shall I go? Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Amy. Um, I'm calling from Sheffield today in England. Um, I'm working a bit across different disciplines. I'm in music psychology and computer science with a background in music technology. Um, and I'm really interested in analyzing sound in lots of different domains. So I was initially coming from a kind of sound art background where I tried to use sound as a way to um, allow the participation or interaction in a piece, um, but hit difficulties on how 
uh, human listening adapts to the environment, but the technology I was using was very fixed. So I kind of started studying that for more um, work. And I do now I'm um, working part time on projects to do with hearing impairment and part time to do with machine listening, different applications in healthcare and education and so on. Um, but particularly interested in the live settings and how we could better use these kind of techniques in art than in some of the applications that are proposed. So that's why I'm here. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yes, I'll go. Uh, I'm Barrett. Um, I'm, uh, I do a few different things across a few different disciplines, but I'm mainly a musician. And um, I've been, you know, I've played in a lot of different bands and done a lot of different projects, everything from like experimental sort of like improv improvisational sound and to heavy metal to dance music to just a bunch of different things, which is neither here nor there. But I also am writing sort of like theory fiction as well as um, social and political commentary and trying to find ways to fuse all these things. And I, I, I did part of an undergraduate program in fine art at, a, at California Institute of the Arts, but that was quite some time. So I'm just, I go, so I'm just sort of like getting my feet uh, wet again in terms of like academic sort of study stuff. But um, yeah, that's, that's basically it. Yeah. All right, I guess I'll just go. Um, I'm Alice. I am doing undergrad in Australia. I'm a visual artist, mostly working with media art, hypertextual hyper stuff, lambda movie, stuff like that. Um, and yeah. Also, um, if I like leave, don't try and chase me up. It's like 2 a.m. here, so I might need to rest. Oh, boy. Good morning, good night. <laughs> okay. I can, I can go really quick. Um, hi, my name is William. I'm an arts writer and critic living in Dallas. Um, I'm just interested in digital forensics in general. Um, and I'm hoping uh, to find a writing application, you know, either journalistic or just kind of like generally gaining a broader knowledge on this subject matter. So, yeah. Um, I guess I can go. Um, my name's Josh Westerman. I'm calling in from LA. Um, I just finished up a master's at a uh, California Institute of the Arts in experimental sound practices and intermedia art. Um, taking this class because I, I mean I have a background in sound but I'm particularly interested in uh, digital forensics and right now I guess what am I working on? Right now I'm working on a toolkit sort of um, attempt to resist this uh, like onslaught of um, how algorithmic detection is um, affecting various musical communities. So like say um, artists being sued for like the use of samples in a piece on SoundCloud or something like that. Um, very interested in how that like affects marginalized groups and um, other like creative folk. Um, yeah, that's about it for now. Okay. I guess I'll go. Mm. Uh, hi, I'm Meredith. I'm in New York. Um, I'm background in computer science, and I I run a uh, like a uh, art apparel company. And I'm um, I I play classical guitar, but my fantasy is to uh, become a a artisanal pedal maker for electric guitar. But I'm um, very interested in, in notions of surveillance and in transduction between different kinds of digital media. Is my is my mic not working? 
No, it's working fine. Yeah, I heard you. Yeah, that's good. That sounds super interesting. Um, okay, so is that everybody? Um, has everyone introduced themselves or herself? If so, we can, okay. we can start and I can, can let the, the, the structure speak. Yeah, I mean, um, actually, it's really amazing to see and hear all what you're doing because, I mean, it's quite um, specific in many ways. Um, it's, it, there's a broad spectrum, but I think there's a specific set of concerns that seem to me um, between sort of like art, media, and, um, and text, writing. So I think that's going to be great uh, for kind of like opening up discussion because um, in many ways, well, first of all, I'm not really going to talk about my work, right? So, of course, there is some opportunity to see my work here and there. Um, we'll talk about it in some ways, but I'm not going to ever kind of give artist talk or explain installations or anything like that. I'm really going to sort of like present to you work that is really between or negotiating between kind of um, advocacy and kind of like law and legal arguments between uh, sort of scientific, uh, borrowing scientific uh, knowledge um, and applying it to certain things. Um, and uh, political discourse, and also how that all kind of like emerges and why that emerges from the perspective of an artist. Um, so the kind of crossing between kind of like art, advocacy, law, and science. And, you know, I actually um, uh, really believe in art. It's a weird thing to say. I think people are really cynical about it. I actually think it's um it's i think it's it's a mode of truth production and that's in many ways why i don't want to talk about the work i do as such because i think and care about the ways in which art comes to its truths and tells its truths and we can discuss how and why that is but um that's done through the space and time of art and the gallery and so here i want to kind of just like move through what is now a kind of decade-long research into more or less an unwritten history of um, forensic listening that starts in the mid-80s. Um, and um, try to sort of uh, go through that both historically but also conceptually and from it draw a series of kind of like political uh, claims uh, that I think can really or are really emboldened or strengthened by a focus on listening and not on either speech or either um, uh, in the image. So I'm just going to read you a quick summary of what we're doing across the four sessions. So we have entered an era in which radically new modes of listening proliferate. The demands placed on the ears by and before the law continue to increase, and with more sophisticated technologies, horizons, and audible uh, of the horizons of the audible continue to broaden. Yet our understanding of the politics of listening remains limited and lacks the attention afforded of speech and the voice, for example. So how has forensic listening redefined what constitutes legitimate speech? How do audio technologies and their applications impact the production of truth? So in the second session, it's the question, how was how is forensic listening, redefined what constitutes legitimate speech. That's what we're going to be dealing with next week. In the, the week after that, how do audio technologies and their applications impact the production of truth? How can the interpretation, interpretation of oral testimony within systems of justice become more sensitive to the material qualities of sound? I'm going to be talking about that a little bit today and finally in the last session. So the project I've been working on seeks to kind of like redefine what constitutes, in a way, like a just hearing. 
and can I propose new ways by which to hear those at the threshold of politics? And in a way, that's the kind of like bit in which art is so important because in order to kind of like experiment with and redefine uh, uh, frames of listening, you need spaces in which experimentation is possible. So I will discuss with you novel practices of listening, recording, and audio analysis that have emerged since the mid 80s, uh, which is the dawn of forensic listening. And I will do that in order to understand both historically, technology, and culturally how the contemporary ear has been kind of constructed. So the main thing is to kind of show that there's a shift in power from oral to aural in a way from a contract between kind of like speaking subjects to a set of applied strategies for listening through which could unfold audio investigations. So we're going to be talking about a series of real life cases on which I've worked on firsthand as a kind of quote unquote expert listener, but more actually as an artist. And we're going to explore the conditions under which, under uh, conditions by which judges, lawyers and police um, forensic linguists and witnesses listen. So basically, how is audible evidence currently being produced and how can we produce it otherwise? Each case or set of cases presents a proposition to expand the political ear. From the UK's unjust analysis of asylum seekers, which is the next week's thing, to a ballistic study of a gunshot fired at a Nakba Day protest in Palestine, which was based on the video you saw today. Okay, also, can I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, what will be the style of the assignments uh, all throughout the course? Uh, the style of the assignments will be uh, presentations based on texts or videos or sounds that we're going to listen to. So someone will be assigned with the, with the presentation for the next week. Of course, this week there is no presentation. And another thing, um, I think that if it, it would be better if every 15 minutes or 20 minutes, I might want to ask someone to ask a question to you. Okay. Because in this way, the conversation will, will be, will, will maybe be better. That's not a problem at all. Okay. Okay, so like I said, we have the kind of like UK accent asylum, uh, asylum seekers, we have Nakba Day protests, we have the contestation of evidence given at the uh, shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. We have different kinds of algorithmic listening software to, uh, to think through and analyze and, and think about their effects. And finally, in the last session, to the set of lessons and reflections that I have taken from the reconstruction of a torture prison in Syria from ear witness testimony, which I did uh, in April 2016 for Amnesty International. So the form and content of these cases both involve moments in which forensic listening has groundbreaking uh, or like a kind of emancipatory potential and instances of the discipline's negative employment as kind of just a simply a state surveillance apparatus. So often there is a kind of like collapse here between kind of form and content where the conditions of listening are inseparable from the issues of the case and sonic material must be examined hand in hand with the ways in which it is perceived by the authorities ordained with the power to listen. And by that I mean essentially we're both going to at the kind of like material qualities of sound and the sort of like ways in which so, so the capacity for hearing and the politics of hearing, right? The socio-politics of hearing. Just like in the essay I sent through, there's this kind of keen distinction between tone deafness and deafness, right? So a kind of like cultural deafness and a, and a, and a, and a hearing impairment and sort of like where they meet each other and how they talk to each other. So, um, I'm going to argue for like a radical repurposing of forensic technologies rather than a kind of like reactive mistrust of them. So, you know, often people just say like, oh, blanket surveillance is bad, technology is bad. I mean, I know I'm talking to new center people, so that's not going to be like a radical thing. <laughs> In most universities, it's radical, but I'm guessing you guys already kind of like on that wave. 
And this is like, of course, because those technologies can be kind of like turned. You can use them to listen back, right, from the position of a kind of counter forensics, as uh, A.L. Weitzman would call it. So the investigations I'm going to present kind of test the boundaries between kind of signal and noise, sound and silence, and testimony and evidence. And that last one is super important. I'm going to go into it le uh, constantly throughout the thing. So sound complicates the dif distinction between testimony and evidence. And that's actually extremely significant because sometimes voice that is uttered in the framework of a subjective testimony turns into a kind of object of study in and of itself. And I think there's something very um, scary, but also potentially interesting about that move. And we're going to talk about that mostly, most clearly next week, and then kind of just keep building on that. And basically, the reason why this kind of like fluctuation between kind of like testimony and evidence happens is because whenever it comes to sound, what sound is defined as is, is a kind of porous border, right? So sound makes borders porous, essentially. Sound seeps through architecture, and it seeps between the senses. So we'll encounter various forms of border crossing throughout these next sessions, and that might be kind of like material, juridical, sensorial, ontological, or conceptual. So my analysis open up to questions of the interplay between kind of like foreground and background sounds, the role of the voice, the freedom of speech versus the right to silence. And together, these cases map out the kind of like thresholds of, of basically of audibility that might be human or machinic as kind of cultural and political frontiers where issues of subjecthood and citizenship are in the process of being defined. So that's the kind of like broad thing I want to say. And of course, today's session is anyway an introduction. Uh, to the whole, uh, uh, well, I'm going to go into a more meaningful introduction now. That's just to kind of give you an overview of the whole thing. But is there any questions at this stage? Okay, I'll just continue. I don't know, maybe if there's a question, you, you unmute or Flavio unmute? I don't really get this system. We need to understand. Uh, if, anyone, if anybody wants to ask a question, he or she has to unmute himself or her. Or ah, himself. okay. Okay, great. So these are like mute I have, buttons. A, I have a quick, well, I don't know yeah, if it's sure. a quick question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, so like, I understand that uh, the purpose of this class is sort of to like, we as an audience are um, open to uh, the radical repurposing of surveillance technologies. Um, but I'm wondering if like you as the instructor have like a specific or like a targeted direction uh, objective of that like radical purpose. <laughs> um... Or if you're like trying to guide us in some particular direction. Because like oh, I mean, sure, yeah. I yeah. like I can definitely uh, speculate on plenty of like counter forensic objectives of such technologies, but I, I do like to have direction when I'm when I'm learning about a technical subject matter. Well, I mean, look, I'm gonna talk to you through cases, through examples, basically. Yeah. So each time we encounter something, we will kind of like go into it. Technically, of course, I know a little bit about some things and a lot about other things, but I'm not going to be able to sort of like give a full breakdown. Technical. Like we're not going to go so deep into the sort of like inner workings of certain algorithms, etc. That if that's what I understand from your question. Sure. But um, for sure, if I understood another first of your question, for sure, there's an agenda on my part. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. There's a there's a politics I believe are radical and a police I don't think are radical and I I'm not gonna I mean you you're gonna see how that unfolds through the yeah. through the sessions and we're gonna discuss that but um, yeah yeah I'm not okay. pretending to be um, objective here if that does that answer your question yeah yeah absolutely thank you okay great 
Anything else? So in, in a way, I wanted to talk about, um, I wanted to kind of like speak through the film I shared and the case that that uh, dealt with. So, and I want to do that again, because I think this touches on a lot of the interests of some people is like sort of why art in a way. I'm going to give you my feelings on that just as a kind of means by which we can sort of set up the, the kind of historical technological discussions over the next weeks and kind of refer back to some of these um, claims I'm making. So, as I said, I'm a kind of like artist slash private ear, which means I'm also doing kind of independent audio investigations. And the works I make are adapted for different forums, um, which includes galleries and museums, but also sort of sites of advocacy and legal work. And what's different about what I do versus what forensic architecture do is that those two things are separated, right? The work I make for museums are of a different order than the same narrative that I'm telling to advocacy work or to legal fr frameworks. Um, However, a lot of the cases I have worked on have been with forensic architecture. So when, whenever there's a case to do with uh, sound, so forensic architecture, for those who don't know, is an agency based at Goldsmiths University, a research agency run by A.L. Weitzman, um, who do kind of like uh, architectural spatial analysis for uh, different uh, kinds of um, uh, rights-based groups, um, let's say like that. Um, and uh, so I've done a lot of work with them. I've done some other work not with them, but mainly I work through them and with them. And my feeling is that we need to operate within of the modes of kind of like truth production that are offered by various, th various kind of like platforms because we're trying to kind of like do something. So be that asylum or immigration tribunals, which I'm going to talk about today, or um, uh, you know, human rights reports. But we also need to be specific about the ways that, let's say, other mediums can come to their truths and that be, be that kind of like art, which I, so, so, so for me, there's a clear distinction. So though I worked on the case um, of the Nakba Day killing and though I provided the key evidence to show that uh, Ben Derry killed uh, uh, Nadim Nawara and Muhammad Abu Dhahar, my that wasn't the evidence that was submitted. That was another way that I thought more adequately told that story than the way that it circulated on the news and in human rights cases. But the case I've worked on have included murder investigations, um, uh, an inclusive investigation into a Syrian prison, which I told you about a little bit before. Um, and I've also analyzed voices on kind of like a wiretap phone recording to see if it belonged to a Russian oligarch. Uh, I've set up counter surveillance platforms, uh, which is on permanent display and online in, in Liverpool, the Hummingbird Clock. Um, and I've testified in the UK and Asylum Tribunal as to the unethical and unscientific practices of voice analysis for the determination of origin of refugees. So the kind of like practice-based work or those components are composed uh, through a selection of those cases. And we're going to go into the kind of like theoretical and aesthetic ref reflections of those things. But each session will be kind of like, yeah, we'll, we'll see the, the cases that I've been part of producing, as well as those artworks that I've been talking about, through which I'm trying to develop a kind of like spatial and aesthetic argument through which to push the investigations beyond their immediate concerns with kind of like the death of a single subject, for example and experiment with the forms by which kind of like evidence could be presented, but also by the ways, in, and in doing that, ways in which certain forms of relationality and collectivity can emerge beyond the ways the sort of that um, the law kind of like reduces things to its, to its, to the bare kind of like, uh, to the bare elements of, or the sum total of, 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 a, of an individual's victimhood. So technically, like some of you, it's my training as a musician and with the technologies that surround like music production that allows me to work on forensic audio investigations. So 
it's nothing really that special. I don't have any special knowledge. I've just been using it in a specific way. A lot of you would know, would be very familiar with the things I'm doing. So it's very clear to quote unquote the expert in expert listening, because I think what's important is actually these techniques are, are widely available. And I like that I'm using very available things and not complicated things. But I have a certain fluency in some of them. The technologies, of course, that are made to record and produce music enables one to understand the anatomy of a sound uh, and, you know, to understand different types of distortion, different types of noise, um, and also to, to learn how to read sound through image, right? And I think that's important. Um, also, of course, you work a lot with space, with reverb, so you, you start to sort of understand the ways in which acoustics manipulate sound. And I'd be able to identify different kinds of reverberation the more you kind of like do it and do these things. So these skills were kind of like vital to understanding and employing the software uh, specifically used for kind of like forensic audio examination. Uh, but I would say more so it is the kind of like formal training as an artist that has uh, augmented this kind of like non-expert but proficient training in musical production. And why that is, is because the approach of visual art has taught me a kind of certain sensitivity to, to aesthetics and an intensity through which to kind of like look and listen to the world. So like the idea really that artists are people who notice things that no one else really cares about. They kind of like notice, try and reproduce them. They're kind of like bothered by them, kind of like images that stay with them. Um, uh, you know, things about the world that are, that are otherwise kind of incidental. And I think that has something very kind of like forensic about it. And, you know, in a way you could think of like Antonioni's uh, blow up or the audio equivalent, which is more equivalent, uh, more relevant here, the, the blowout by Brian De Palma in 1981. And in both those films, kind of like artists become murder investigators, right? And they do that because in those films, it's the intensity at which they kind of like, they know their material, they know their form, they know the, the ways in which, um, for example, in Antonioni's, it's the grain of the image, right? So he sees in the grain of the image, the kind of like murder taking place over the photographs as he's like developing them. Um, so the film sound recorder, which is John Travolta in Blowout, the way he kind of like observes, hears and seeks to reproduce his world is, is through a kind of close attention to the kind of like formal qualities, the process of reproduction and the composition of every grain or kind of like sh uh, noise in an audio recording. And this results in both artists unintentionally becoming forensic investigators in those films. So I don't think that's, that's not a coincidence. I think it's those things meet each other in, in technical ways, in, in, in quite easy uh, equivalent, in quite an easy zone of equivalence. Um, and we're going to yeah, talk about also how forensic audio is also kind of like akin to some more kind of like avant-garde types of listening that were also going on in the 60s and 70s. So artists become kind of like witnesses to crimes at the threshold of kind of like the image or the threshold of, of detectability because it is at the limits of visibility and audibility that artists are trained to observe, document, and reproduce events. So, you know, we could say... It's also about the ways in which artists are taught. And I think this is also a very interesting lesson through which, which art school proliferates, which is the kind of inseparability of the work from its context. So that everything in a work of art is legible or meaningful um, to the extent that infra infrastructural forms of display play a role in the work, right? So every video artist knows that the electricity cabling kind of connecting the screen is, is, is an important element for consideration as every painter realizes that the kind of light conditions of the room in which the painting display become part of the, the painting is, itself, right? So artists are, are then always kind of like told when installing works that you're the only one who will see or notice uh, a certain detail, significant or meaningful, right? So like usually people say like, oh, don't worry, no one's gonna see that. No one's gonna notice it. You're the only one who will pay any mind to this or that imperfection. And in many ways, kind of like my work as a hybrid audio investigator and artist embraces being from a profession, which is art, 
that is frequently reminded of its peculiarity for noticing this or that minutia or barely perceptible traces that become exaggerated to the extent that they can distort um, a intention or expression, right? Again, this is the sort of idea that the small traces, the small things, are, are how a kind of uh, a, a whole a totality is made. So my work as a private ear can be understood as an extension of the artist's obsessive attention to detail, where negative space, infrastructural conditions, usually designated as background, become central to the expression as the, as the voice in the foreground. Right? Any questions here? So it's also this kind of like confluence of form and concept that allows art for a comprehensive representation of events to emerge. So it enables me, for example, to both focus on the specifics of a case, like I said before, the kind of like particular uh, elements of a, of a, a um, gunshot or, or crack in sound or particularly particular kind of distortion. Um, but also on the kind of like ways in which that kind of resonates in a room, which resonates in a city, which resonates across thing, which hits someone through a wall, you know, all those things also become part of it. So it means that we're talking about specific kinds of audio in order to generate a series of reflections on the politics of the senses more broadly. Um, so it is really a kind of combination of technical pr proficiency, and an expanded and experimental approach of visual art that has fostered um, my sort of like ability to operate within the current regime of tr truth production, where I work for legal and humanitarian organizations, but also seek to experiment with new mechanisms for speaking the truth that do not so neatly adhere to the forums built for the hearing of evidence. Um, so you're going to hear like claims that are the threshold of audibility and the gaps of speech, paying attention not only to the voice in the foreground, but to the buzzing of a neon light, uh, we're going to talk about in session four, um, not only the communication, but to the strategies of amplification of the voice itself, not only the oral perception of sound, but to its seepage um, uh, between the senses. Um, and so then, the kind of truths that I'm interested in uh, and the kind of things that you'll see manifest in the works are the truths that are inseparable from elements of the environment in which the sound under analysis resounds, right? So throughout these, these sessions, the kind of like you're gonna see the material sonic evidence examined inseparably with the means to which it becomes politically perceived. Again, like the tone deafness and the deafness deafness. In order to do this, I'm going to employ a combination of strategies from the field of forensic audio analysis, visual and radiophonic art, and critical discourse, ranging from law to theology and philosophy. And basically, through that, you could suggest alternative ways for crimes to be heard. So, um, uh, So, I have a question. Yes. It's just what you said. It sounds as if um, the crimes that you're talking about or the situations that you're talking about are contemporary situations. Like, there are, that's us. are we talking about things that you're somehow able to capture at the moment that they're happening? Or are we also talking about things that you know that have happened? <laughs> That's, a, that's another question, right? I, so something that you don't have the recording of that, how would you go back with some kind of um, forensic yeah. procedure? It's just, it's just a wonder. In the, in the last session, in the fourth session, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. Okay. Because I'm going to speak about a prison in Syria where all we had actually was the memories of those who were trapped, well, basically incarcerated in a room Right. Never heard anything. Um, you never saw the space. It was dark, right. blindfolded when they came in. So the only experience was sound. So how do you kind of like uh, create dedicated ear witness interviews 
that take on a lot of the theory and practice that I'm going to speak about and how do you kind of like apply them to those uh, moments where um, where the only material trace is memory and subjective account and that's where we're really going to kind of like refine what is radical about this shift between testimony and evidence or or the turn from or the ways in which you could hear testimony as forms of evidence as material traces of, of, the, of events but in the case that I'm going to talk about today which is the one through which Robert Cotter Steele is based on it was very much a case where we had the recordings we had the sound so CNN was on the ground filming and they incidentally though the camera was pointing away the gunshots were captured in the in the microphone so um, though it's not uh, a work of audio as such um, the fictional transcript that I wrote for uh, rubber coated steel and the accompaniment of the film is an example of the kind of approach to audio argumentation that I'm talking about between and through legal artistic statements. Um, and that is that in the specifics, of, the specifics of the case, which include a kind of like tension between seeing and hearing and silence, and the sonics of violence are embedded into this kind of like scenography in which the film is shot, right? The film and, trans and transcript compose an artwork that chronicles the real audio analysis I submitted as part of a larger body of evidence produced by Forensic Architecture for an advocacy and awareness campaign called No More Forgotten Lives by uh, Defense for Children International. Uh, so it's a fictional reinterpretation of a real case I worked on and there's a reason why I use fiction in that way and it's why it's important. Um, so to give some context, the real life case is of uh, the case of Ben Derry, who was the uh, Israeli bodyguard in question. He was initially charged with manslaughter uh, of Nadim Nawara. And then in December 2016, uh, this was uh, Nakba 2015, uh, he, he, or 2014, um, I think 2014. Uh, he, uh, so May 2014. Uh, in December 15, uh, the Jerusalem District Court accepted a plea deal for him to be convicted of negligence with regards to the death of one of the boys. So Derry was never tried with the murder of Muhammad Abu Daher, the second boy he killed. And this is despite the fact that, as was shown and demonstrated in the report that we made, and by the NGO and by multiple witnesses on the ground, the sound of the shot that killed both boys had the same sonic signature. So did everyone watch this thing? Or they don't know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I watched it, yeah. Everybody, I watched it? Yeah, we watched it. <laughs> okay, okay. So, um, so basically the same sonic signature, which means live ammunition suppressed by a rubber bullet adapter. So the findings of my work together with the larger investigation by forensic architecture, which include visual and spatial analysis, show that both boys were killed in the same location um, and indicating that the shooter was aiming from the same vantage point both times, right? So this means that Muhammad Abu Daha was killed just hours later on the same day in the same location and most probably with the same gun, derived from the fact that they are both... Uh, sorry, that they are both killed by a gunshot with the specific sonic characteristics. These almost identical circumstances that surround the, uh, the not, not formally investigated death of Muhammad Abu Daha strengthen the allegation of Nadim Nawara's death. So it shows that one cannot be an accident, right, in some ways. In other words, the inadequate charge of manslaughter and the conviction of an even less serious charge of negligence can only stand for as long as Muhammad Abu Daha's killing is not brought to trial, right? So there was a kind of specific reason why only one of those um, uh, uh, boys was charged. It was a tactic to kind of like isolate the event from any kind of uh, series of kind of relations that ha happened on the same day. Because one says something else about the other and, and vice versa. So I, the whole point um, that in the real trial of Ben Derry, the two boys' deaths become separated. 
and this altered the verdict considerably in Derry's favor. So compelled by this distorted narrative, this depiction I wrote in my court transcript seeks to document the crimes committed on that day, uh, holds these two deaths as an inseparable part of the same crime. And that's actually how we had to do the sound investigation, because you have to look for patterns. Um, and so, yeah. Um, in the fictional transcript, unlike the trial of Ben, uh, the trial Ben Derry faced uh, in reality, the court deliberates over the real evidence that I produced, together with the evidence forensic architecture uh, produced of the two murders of Abu Dahar and Nawara. And there was another boy who was shot in the stomach that's the same day, uh, in the same way, which is by a uh, live ammunition suppressed by a rubber bullet adapter. And um, again, uh, just to give some context, so you cannot fire a rubber bullet, you cannot fire a live ammunition accidentally, right? Um, you cannot because it will create a backfire, because you have to, you know, uh, rubber bullets are like old school muskets. You, you put the rubber bullet in the end of the barrel and you fire a, a, a blank. And the blank causes enough gas to throw the bullet out of the, um, the rubber bullet out of the gun at a significant speed, 150 meters per second, but not at the, uh, not at a, at a kind of fatal, but not, um, uh, let's say less fatal speed. I don't know what the, t the I think they call it non-lethal, but it's certainly lethal. Uh, rubber bullet hit you in the head, kill you. So, um, so, uh, so, so I try to like, kind of like bring them together in that film. And that's because again, I'm trying to use this until there has been an adequate trial. I'm trying to say that this film is the trial, um, of, uh, that case. So the pairing of the two deaths is not only, uh, to communicate a more comprehensive study of the crime committed by Ben Derry that was not achieved in the real trial, but also as I will expand on is to break the logic of singularity, the compartmentalized structures according to which evidence is processed, and by which the possibility to examine the wider structural violence is always precluded. And that's something we're gonna see all over this um, uh, next session, the breaking the logic of singularity and how sound breaks that logic. So um, this transcript is therefore written not only to transmit audio evidence components. Sorry, yes. sir, yeah. Uh, can you say a little bit more about this logic of singularity? Is that I'm what? Gonna go uh, I'm going to go. Okay. About the, yeah, no okay. So that's what's established by the system, I suppose. That's the ways in which the law kind of like comes to its evidence, right? It draws lines around things, it isolates things. Things can never be seen um, in their relational qualities, um, and that actually strips unless you have sound, and this is what makes sound a very strange object of evidence because it's only relational, it only works through its kind of reflection off walls or if it's, or, or of other things I'm going to talk about now. So, so the transcript is therefore written not only to transmit audio evidence of this case, but also to attempt to capture through specific focus on sound, the problems of listening inherent to the legal production of truth, right? So in this way, this transcript is diagrammatic of my broader methodology, wherein when, when which the audibility of rights receives the same forensic examination as audio evidence itself. So the conditions of listening and the material realities of sound, just like the necessity to examine the deaths of both these boys, are inseparable. And one of the strongest ways I believe this inseparability could be made is to is made manifest is to be kind of like rewriting the trial, intervening into and reimagining the legal record. So some of the language included in this fictional trial derives from my experiences testifying in another real trial at the Asylum and Immigration Tribunal in London, 2014, and that was when I was called as an expert witness, expert witness, quote unquote, in the deportation hearing of a Palestinian asylum seeker where I was contesting the results of an unjust, unjust accent analysis um, to which he was subject. So I was called in by his defense lawyer because I had undertaken extensive research into the company administering the accent tests, which is a company in Sweden called Sprakab, 
and I had interview all the low, basically low level analysts and the senior linguists working there. And so basically, um, uh, no one had done that research on that company. They had just received the tender based on a kind of proposal they submitted to the UK government. And um, uh, so I was called in uh, to speak on behalf of, of the asylum seeker uh, talking about uh, uh, this company. And um, what I wanted to say is uh, that's what we're going to deal with that, that case we're going to specifically deal with next session. But in this session, I'm using mostly the, the film I sent you as a means by which we introduce the sort of melding between kind of like methodologies that we're going to speak about um, between our advocacy science. Um, so uh, in this case, the specifics of, of this accident analysis we'll, 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 we'll talk about later, but the trial that informed the writing of this transcript uh, for rubber coated steel is useful to speak out about by ways of understanding kind of like the thresholds of legal listening. And that's if we look at the final exchange between the judge and my, myself, right? So in relation, so the judge says to me uh, in the very end of, of this kind of like quite grueling 50 minutes cross-examination, he says, in relation to your research on Sprackab, this company, and LADO, which is the accident analysis of asylum seekers, did you reach a conclusion about the efficacy of Sprackab, the company? I say, yes, I concurred with the linguists whom I interviewed, who essentially are against its use to determine people's origins because of the basic fact that a voice or an accent should not exist as a kind of passport. Judge, but do you find that Sprackab could work using the methodology that they use with some tweaking, or do you think the process is wholly wrong? Me, I think it needs to be much more thorough if it is to work. I think that 12-minute interviews are not sufficient. I think it needs to take into account that people's biographies are more than simply where they come from, right? So the idea that the voice is a biography, this is my argument I was making. The voice is a biography, not a birth certificate. So after this exchange, there was a recess, and the defense lawyer explained to me that he was pleased with the answer, but that he didn't like at all that the judge had asked me that question about my opinion, um, whether it was wholly wrong or not. That was, he, what he said is, this is a well-established kind of like trap that judges set to try and identify a person's giving testimony as politically biased, right? So if I had answered uh, that it was wholly wrong, taking his language or similar in my response, then this would have nullified the entirety of the evidence I had presented on that day, as he was in fact baiting me at the threshold of legal audibility. And if I took the bait and crossed that line, my entire testimony would be struck through as the opinions of a politically biased and irrational subject, right? That such a threshold exists and is relatively, is relatively well known, right? The law must be seen to remain neutral and operate within the boundaries written into law, right? And the clear distinction in law, which is, of course, from my perspective, nonsense, is between law and politics, right? Those, they, they, they kind of very keen on making that line bright and fine, but as, of course, many of us have seen in many, in any of the recent cases that have happened, immigration or otherwise, in America or wherever, that the line is not so clearly uh, defined. So I had not interpreted, um, so basically, where the judge decides to position this line of neutrality is, of course, a political act in, in and of itself, right? So it, it's, it's political because it's occluded from those who testify and who are not legally experienced. So I didn't know that that line really existed. Of course, I knew I shouldn't say what I really believed, uh, which is that the border itself is wholly wrong, not only that the accent test is wrong. If I'd said that, he would think I'm totally cuckoo, right? And then the whole thing, I, anything I said, no matter if it's right or wrong, whatever, it just goes out. So I had not interpreted that question as a frame uh, for this border between irrelevant political opinion in his eyes and legitimate testimony until I was made aware of it by the lawyer. 
So there were stakes embedded in my response that were coded into legal forms of listening, but they were inaccessible to myself as a speaker. In other words, I was able to speak my full opinion. You know, I was given free speech. I could say whatever I want. But there was a very narrow bandwidth within which my voice had to perform in order to be legally performative. If I had expressed anything other than a reformist position to what I believed but I but could not say to be wholly scientific, unscientific. So if I had said the, the, this thing is unscientific and unethical, which I believe, my testimony would have been withdrawn from the space of legal performativity. It would have been treated as political opinion and not legal speech, in spite of the fact that it would still remain part of the transcript of the trial, right? So we see how this threshold operates as a conclusion that does not, op does not censor the speaker in ob obvious or tangible way but rather by setting invisible and intangible limits on legal audibility, which mean that one's well-informed testimony can become legally inaudible and therefore irrelevant while remaining physically audible to everyone present. So the conditions of legal listening, and that's why you see basically in the film this, this exploration of that, you know, the, 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 the tension between the, the prosecution, the defense, and the judge is always that, pushing at that, legal audibility, uh, that threshold of which the judge sets, seeing where it is, and, and, and basically kind of depicting the court as a kind of place where that threshold is tested. So these conditions of legal listening were made doubly audible in this case, as it was a trial about what constitutes legitimate ways of listening to the voice of refugees. It pertained to the deportation of an asylum seeker, which had ruled on the results of an accident analysis of his voice. So essentially it's a trial about the voice and its medium of the trial is the voice. And in this way we can read a collapse in form and content in which the legal conditions of listening performed by the judge become inseparable from the issue of the trial itself where in which someone is literally placed a border on their speech. They say you don't speak like this or that way so we don't allow you in the country. So in this way we can, um, we can say that such cases are the kind of bedrock of my project. They, they're the most intriguing moments because they, you, through that collapse of content and form, you see um, the most lucid analysis of the problems and challenges uh, that we have uh, to listening and, and its politics. And in fact, this experience of an expert witness that compelled me to produce the body of work and theoretical reflections that I'm going to share with you. So while there are countless readings of speech, the voice, and utterance, the politics of listening remains more or less unresolved. And that's what allows this kind of like, you know, free speech to exist there. The fact that I can say anything I want, I'm not censored, but because people are so careful and so attentive to censorship in liberal democracies, but what they're not attentive to is where other forms of censorship exist in the in the structural conditions of listening. So, um, so further chronicling my experience at the Asylum Tribunal and how the creation of artworks provide a space in which to experiment and expand the tight thresholds of legitimate speech offered by legal and political forums. It's that we can actually, it's actually a place where we can open up new kinds of sonic claims that are actually impossible in those spaces, right? So in the next two sessions, I'm going to document how the kind of like pushing at the boundaries of legal audibility is central to my work as well as uh, the pioneering uh, historical work of forensic audio, audio investigators that I find inspiring. Um, and here we will, we will see, especially in the next session, how accents become legally accountable and how sounds that were once part of what would be conventionally defined as the blurred background noise are increasingly being used to construct accounts in space and time. <clears throat> so, um, so the authoring of my uh, transcript in Robert Coded Steel sought to represent the ways in which conditions of legal listening were inextricable from the content of the trial and its judgments, using the artistic license of fiction to emphasize this. So basically saying that I needed to create a trial that it was about the suppression of those sounds 
in order to be able to analyze not only that sound, but how sound, how the courtroom is also a kind of sonic weapon, just as I had experienced in the immigration tribunal. So one of the ways in which I realized um, the application, or, uh, one of the ways in which I thought about this is, is the thing about the inaudible in the court record. So you know when a transcri transcriber doesn't hear or understand someone, they, they use this inaudible in square brackets. Um, so that means it's a sound that is not officially recognized uh, by the bearers of legitimate speech in court, a sound which cannot be heard or made intelligent or intelligible to the courtroom. A voice that is not possible to write or a sound that cannot be transcribed does not make a historical record except as an anonymous mark of inaudibility. So, of course, the transcript is what becomes the historical record of a trial. It is those inaudible voices and sounds that are not intelligible to the political ear that become the site of struggle for the politics of listening. Um, and the cases, I'm, the, the kind of three main cases I'm going to present through these sessions uh, basically um, speak to that. Um, that question of how to deny or listen past silence or what has been formally and politically designated as inaudible. And so the use of inaudible in this script is a uh, build on the legal dramaturgy that in part borrows its structure from uh, a short play written by Harold Pinter in 1988 it's called Mountain Language. And then, although not directly referring to these events, the play emerges at a time where the Kurdish language was criminalized in Turkey and where Margaret Thatcher had put into legislation something called the broadcast ban in the UK, which stated that no direct statements made by the IRA should be aired or could be aired, right? which revolved in a very weird situation where people were... Um, so the sound of Jerry Adams during this time was removed and actors lip-synced his voice as a way to get around the band. So it was not him speaking, it was the same thing that you heard, but you heard him dubbed, but he was speaking English. It was crazy. You can see examples on YouTube. So this play it came out exactly that year, 1988, and it revolves around a banned language, and it acts, it, it, the, the, the four acts uh, unfold in the kind of absurd, violent bureaucracy of a prison visitation room. So the tension develops from the kind of like forcible banning of the kind of like mountain language, which forbids even the audience from hearing it, right? So the audience never actually hears it. So every time it's a nearly spoken, um, it's cut off. So the audience is brought into a kind of relation of empathy that wills the band voices to be heard throughout the play until at the end of the play, the band is suddenly and inexplicably lifted. So the guards inform the prisoners uh, to instruct uh, his elderly mother uh, that she can now speak. And at this point, the play flips from being a kind of like agitprop basic theater piece against censorship uh, and the sort of audience empathetic to the, to the censored subjects to addressing the violence of representation itself. So it does both those things. Because when the mother is asked to speak, they're just these pauses. There's these, these uh, stage directions which just say pause. And the son is saying, like, you can speak, but you just have these stage directions which say pause. And so the, her son kind of like intensifies his, his imploring for her to speak, but the mother does not respond. And with each pause, where uh, brackets the, the, the director's marks, that constitutes the mother's silence, the audience is given time to digest that the violence of the situation lies as much in the banning of language as it is in the granting of the permission to speak. So in either case, the fund fundamental power is kind of like asserted over the speaker. So the, the, the play distills the problem of what constitutes legitimate speech in the same way that legal theorist Peter Goodrich defines the law as a practice of others speaking for you, a process of translation or dubbing. And, um, uh, you know, again, this is similar to, the, to, to my experience in the asylum tribunal. And indeed, I was kind of like reminded of mountain language when I was attempting to, to negotiate the fragile conditions of the inaudible or the pause in square brackets 
in the case against Ben Derry, right? So in my transcript, rather than actual ban on language, legalese is employed as a technology. So legalese, you know, the language of the law, is employed as a technology through which the defense renders the prosecution's words unspeakable or unheard, or retroactively unhears them, right? By canceling them, objecting to them, and getting them struck from the, the record. Uh, this happens any particular time the prosecution wants to bring in witnesses and voices from the perspective of the young protesters. So any time the prosecutor wants to speak for uh, people. It is intended that the reader of my transcript feels the injustice each time these protesters' voices are struck from the record, and yet the crescendo of tension does not come at the moment these voices are finally heard, but rather when they are employed to speak by the prosecution, their champion, and when they rather perform their own inaudibility to the court. So although this is a speculative scenario, it is reflective of the paradoxical politics of silence that were articulated throughout my work on the actual case. And that's what I'm going to speak about now. Oh, actually, I'm going, to, I'm going to say something about uh, seeing through sound before that. Um, so, this, the, this, the, this is basically concerned with listening at the thresholds of sound and voice, and that sometimes those thresholds of sound itself become image or replaced by visual memory, as we're going to see in chapter 3. So many of the sounds that play in my cases are sounds from the background, noises that seep into a recording, sounds that leak into phone calls, through walls, across national borders. Sound is thus defined not by its blurred boundaries, as I said before, not contained and isolated. Sound waves are not objects with clear boundaries, but rather sources of energy that make air and objects around them vibrate, right? So it's very different to light, which is uh, uh, the actual photon travels. In sound, only the, the pressure travels, which moves objects around it, right? So that's a kind of extremely different way in which the transmission uh, hits our senses. And that's a continuation of the inseparability of the object from its context, which I spoke before. Um, so often there's kind of cross-sensory analysis, and, the, and, and this, was, this was definitely the case here. Is there any questions here before I go into this sort of idea about seeing through sound? Okay. Quick, a qu very quick, but maybe you're about to answer this. Um, but getting this is, I mean, certainly just about analysis here. Um, but in terms of um, being able to analyze sound and being able to tell if something is an M16 rifle or if something is a rubber bullet or if something is a rubber bullet being masked or if something is an M16 being masked as a rubber bullet and so on. Um, did you, have you encountered in your work any anything that would be able to tell you? the distance from which a shot is taken. But, um, so obviously, like, acoustics come into this. Um, and from acoustics, you can tell certain things. But like, and maybe, this is, uh, maybe this is not necessarily the purpose of this course. I'm just putting it for my own. Uh, Lawrence, you're muted, or like you have to unmute yourself, I think, or are we all muted? Yeah. Hello, you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. <laughs> okay, that was also, but like, why did you mute Lawrence? I'm, I cannot unmute him now. What? No, I, I was just, I was just a little bit care that you could not talk anymore. we're just we're experiencing yeah. te some technical difficulties so i think, I, think no, I, I was just i was just asking alonso why he muted lawrence i'm sure it's just a slip of the hand that's getting used to this uh interview 
But um, yeah, so I basically, I'm not sure if anyone else, but I'm not sure at what point my question was cut off. Did you hear my question okay? Uh, yeah, yeah, I heard it, yeah. Okay. I don't know, I, I, I don't know how you would work it out. Theoretically, it's possible because, you know, the speed decreases over distance, but uh, I don't really know how you do that through sound because it would be really infinitesimal, the difference in sound, I think. I don't know how you do it. Maybe there's a way. I have not encountered that now. Okay, that's fine. That was just a... Um, so, uh, is there any other question? Is there anything else? Yeah, and, and I think uh, there is, of course, room to speak about the more technical aspects. So, if you have a question about that, just ask me because I'm not going to do that here because everything that I, it's more or less said in the film um, how I came to that conclusion and what was drawn from it. Uh, but I'm going to use that case to speak about a certain kind of politics of listening that I think is going to be helpful as a means of introduction for all the, the sessions that are going to precede this one. Um, so, the murder uh, of Abu Dahar and Nawara could not function through analysis of sound alone. The audio analysis uh, uh, that I did for this case reveals how sight and sound are interdependent and how sound cannot be treated in isolation. So again, we're going to get to this question of singularity through a roundabout way. Um, so, though the cameras on both occasions were not pointing at the victims, at the moment of the bullet's impact, other details captured by the lens were vital in order to corroborate the sounds of the gunshots. Details such as the rubber bullet incidentally caught in mid-flight in photographs that we have, which you actually see in the film. Um, uh, uh, and that's the moment Nadim Nawara was rushed to an ambulance, so it's after, so after the firing of a live shot, someone else fires a rubber bullet. When this photograph was synch synchronized with the CNN footage, because you, uh, not only the CNN footage, but the CCTV camera, you could see, you know, you could place everyone in space where they were with that photograph. You could synchronize that with a, with a gunshot, and then you know that that's the gunshot of the rubber bullet, right? Because you see the rubber bullet in space. And there was only two shots. It's not like there's a lot, they're not like firing automatic weapons. They are firing automatic weapons, but not, uh, they're only firing single shots. It allowed, and so it allowed us to co uh, corroborate the sound of that gunshot with the sound of a rubber bullet, and then compare that sound with the sound that killed the two boys. And in order to claim greater certainty that there is a significant difference between the sound of a rubber bullet and the sound of the shots that killed them, this was very important. So in us, you see a single gold pixel was seen flying out of Ben Derry's uh, rifle, and this was significant as after analyzing many videos of other soldiers firing M16 rifles, we found that the firing, when you're firing live am ammunition, the cartridge is automatically ejected from the chamber. However, when rubber-coated steel bullets are fired, the empty cartridge is not automatically ejected. So that there's not enough pressure in the, in the cannon, in the whatever you call it, in the pipe of the gun, to uh, you know, because it needs like a backdraft to pull the, the next bullet into the chamber, right? And when you fire up a bullet, there's not enough gas that creates this draft that, that pulls the, the, that creates the suction that pulls the next bullet up. So what you have to do is manually eject the cartridge by pulling back the, the thing. Uh, so the gold pixel was identified as the immediate discharge of an empty cartridge because they're, the CNN are filming the the, the shooters, right? And so when he fires what, what he claims to be a rubber bullet, you, you see a gold pixel flying out of the cartridge of a gun. So, as we say, rubber bullets cannot push the cartridge out. This gold pixel was identified as the immediate discharge of the empty cartridge and demonstrating that for us that he fired live ammunition. He also does a pizza, which is very, because again, speaks to it, it, uh, intention. He knows this, and he sees them filming. He fires the shot. You see the single gold pixel coming out. He looks at the camera, and he pulls back the thing, ejecting another bullet. Right? So he knows that he's being watched. 
so he ejects a bullet just to eject a bullet, just to, to show that he, he's pretending to fire other bullets. So even in the analysis of the sound themselves, the distinction between an M16 firing a rubber cut steel bullet and an M16 firing a live round through the adapter of a rubber bullet uh, fitted onto the end of the rifle was initially completely inaudible to me. And, and that's what's said in the, in the film, true. Only later could I hear the difference, right, with the aid of spectrograms and visualizations of sound, which showed me the bullets across the, the frequency spectrum. And so by attributing kind of like color temperature or intensity of sonic amplitude indicated to which the frequencies um, uh, behave, uh, you can actually see a very clear difference in, in what those two shots look like and which parts of the frequency spectrum they occupy. So though I could not hear the difference in the sounds only with, with, without visual aid, the distinctions between the shots could be clearly heard by the protesters on the ground. And the fact that it was also perceivable, not, not by sonic, but visual analysis of the crowd's reaction to the gunfire. So you can see that the crowd know the difference because you can look at their reactions filmed on CCTV and by, by other news media that was there. And this is to say also, of course, this all happened before the 100 people were just killed in, in Gaza, murdered in Gaza. But um, in the West Bank, they always try and cover their tracks, right? So, like, for people who don't know the basic politics of Palestine, Gaza, you can slaughter them, right? They're just animals. West Bank, you can kill them, but you need to pretend that you're at least firing non-lethal stuff and stuff like that. And then, of course, the Arabs in Israel, the 48, uh, receive another kind of lesser violence, but it's still inflicted on them in the kind of, like, stretching of the, of the way that the apartheid works there. So, when you study the reactions of those people, you gain insight into the way that the protesters listen, right? And that's a visual information. We, we, you can see that the speed at which they, they fled, cover for cover, correlated with whether or not the shot was live ammunition or rubber coated bullets. So, they're firing rubber bullets. One guy is firing rubber bullets, and they duck, and then they continue throwing stones, right? But, when you hear the shot that kills Nadim Nawara, all the crowd disperse. They just fl flood the minute the shot happens, the flight reaction. Because they know that they're firing live ammunition through a rubber bullet adapter. So, um, through the uh, human rights organization Bet Salem in Israel, and through the testimony of another boy who was shot on that day, Mohammed Azza, you could see um, that Nawara and Abu Dhar were killed. Um, and ev evidence was, was gathered to support the theory that showed that the protesters are able to identify and acoustically the, uh, identify acoustically the different kinds of shots being fired at them. So the crowd's reflex reaction, which you, you can see, um, uh, to, to the sound of live ammunition, shows us that though through the necessity of survival and continued exposure to these sounds, they have developed an acute strategy for audibly discerning the distinction between rubber bullets and live ammunition, or to say it more expressly, between rubber bullets and live ammunition fired and masked through the live, the rubber bullet adapter. Right. So it's very important to say that the shot that killed Nadim Nawara and Hamad Abu Daha was neither live ammunition from an acoustic perspective nor rubber bullet, but a kind of confluence of the two things because of the kind of acoustics of the gun itself with the, with the rubber bullet chamber on the, on the end. So one can conclude then that the firing of live ammunition through a rubber bullet extension is frequent enough for it to become part of an acoustic lexicon that the protesters against the Israeli occupation and apartheid have learned, have embodied. And this is an important break through that allowed the case to move from the specific murder of those boys to, uh, by one soldier to understand that this is a widespread tactic employed by multiple soldiers on multiple occasions where perhaps the cameras and microphones were not there to capture the events of the protest, right? So what I'm trying to say is to, in, to, have, an in, to have an expertise where you can define these different kinds of, uh, and, and identify different kinds of ballistic 
acoustically means an exposure to them. So it doesn't, it doesn't mean this is a freak incident as the, they try to portray it. It means this is actually a kind of serial uh, murder tactic that is employed to mask from the West and from human rights organizations on the ground the sound of serial killing. So let's summarize then the oscillations between sound and image necessary for this one audio analysis. So sounds enabled us to see and images enabled us to hear. Sounds that were captured, that were not captured by the lens of the camera but were recorded onto their microphones. These sounds had to be converted into images, spectrogram re re visualizations, in order for me to hear the difference between the rubber bullet and live ammunition. Then, in order to further demonstrate the practice of firing live ammunition through a rubber bullet adapter, you had to see that it was audible to protesters, and we had to review video material of their reactions. So for a comprehensive analysis of the sound of the protesters listening, the use of image was therefore just as essential as the use of sound. So this is again what we're going to speak about. When we speak about sound, we're never only speaking about sound. Um, so, as illustrated in the, this discussion, sound is taken to exceed defined boundaries, be they spatial or sensorial or um, ontological, as we're going to see. We'll also see how sound exceeds the individual subject or object in its resonance, and it always has its relational qualities. So the material and mediated conditions of sound mediated in the sense that it, it compels vibration rather than photons of light which pass through space. Mean that sound exaggerate common, di common difficulties that arise in the means by which the veracity of any kind of evidence, not only sound, is assessed. So by this I mean that as sound cannot be isolated from the space in which it resounds and the people who perceive it as an article of evidence, it can often fail to meet necessary legal requirements of objectivity, i.e. it's already blurring the lines between subject and object, and therefore it makes people nervous, right? Because it, 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 the law considers the subject to dirty the, the evidence, right? And by example, in the next session, we're going to see how the linguistic phenomenon of code switching means that the sound of one speech is malleable, shifting according to the person who listens to it, right? Code switching is that very idea that now I'm talking to you in a different way than I'm going to go home and talk to my baby, my wife, etc., right? Code switching is about the inherent unfaithful nature of the voice itself. And so listeners produce speech, right? They produce the speech of the other. So we'll see how a person's accent is therefore a difficult object from which to derive evidence of national or regional origin because it is not fixed but potentially transformed by each interlocutor that it meets. An accent or a certain vocal tonality cannot be isolated from its interlocutor or machine from which it is recorded. And as such, analyzing sound is a challenge to the ways that in which evidentiary fragments are conventionally produced. As what I said before, the law isolates and compartmentalizes uh, its, its evidentiary fragments. Uh, it can never see them in, in their relationality. Um, the relational or leaky qualities of sounds under scrutiny threaten their objectivity. Sound and speech can therefore act as propositions for soliciting evidence that is not based on individual units of inspection but rather on the idea that the truth value can be derived out of the very relational quality that sound permits. Right? That's what I'm going to be arguing for, that the truth is actually in that bleed between two things, not in its final result, its, its possibility to, to be kind of extracted and isolated and microscopically analyzed. Is there any questions here? Hey. Natalie. Good. Um, sorry, I missed. I was listening to the first half, but I could just join now. Um, I wanted to, maybe to save this for the end, but I'll just interject now. I remember a couple of years ago in an art history class, a historian and teacher of mine um, was discussing 
um, what he found interesting about, I think it was, we were talking about semiotics and Mika Bal, um, and he found it interesting that uh, in the writing of history and then uh, alternative histories and so forth um, being written through unofficial uh, archives and accounts. So that raises the question uh, about your work, which does something that isn't that isn't completely different uh, from looking at things that are not official uh, state sponsored records or something like that. But what do you think, do, do you come across this question of history and um, history uh, versus forensics in your work and research um, or is that or is that something you're not really that's not at the forefront uh, of your practice? History versus forensics? I mean uh, it's an open question. Maybe others can also contribute. I mean, part of what I'm trying to do is, as you'll see from the next session onwards, is to try and also chart a history of forensic listening. And in doing so, you, of course, have to speak to, you have to try and, you know, um, understand the ways in which people were heard, the context in which they heard, certain technologies that kind of reformulated or or reimagined um, what it meant to be heard. So I think, in that sense, like historiography is important. And also, what's super important for me, as you'll see in the last session, and why this is why I mean, why I'm spending so much time on this thing is because I'm I'm actually kind of arguing also against forensics, right? I mean, in many ways. Don't think that I'm just kind of like uh, saying that. I'm proving a truth. I'm actually arguing for the necessity of art, for the necessity of other productions of truth through which we can understand that through. So that's one thing I want to say. Another thing is um, that what I've very recently super interested in, and which you will see in the last session, is uh, uh, the ways in which towns become historically so uh, uh, essentially Hollywood has given us a very distorted image of what violence sounds like so that means that when in legal cases what you often find throughout history is that essentially people are confronted for to a sound of to the actual sound of violence uh, and they always say there's very often a line which says like it doesn't sound like gunshots it sounded like this don't think it sounded like someone hitting a body, it sounded like this. And they, they will come with something weird because they're used to actually violence being mediated through the sound of violence uh, understood in, in, in different ways. So of course, if, if you live in Beirut, you, you know other kinds of sounds. But um, I'm talking majority people. Uh, so, um, so what I'm trying to see, what, what I'm interested in is those those moments historically, ha which are kind of aforensic in a way, but which speak to a certain kind of um, another kind of listening that is just as operative uh, and speaks about ways of listening uh, through their descriptions. So, for example, um, uh, the the popping of a balloon or someone saying 9/11, they heard fans the sound of a fan being turned on, or uh, in the assassination of Bobby Kennedy, it didn't sound like gunshots, it sounded like a rack of trays landing on the ground. Or in the case of the Syrian prison, many contexts where they said like, no, it didn't sound like this, it sounded like this. And then they would also remember how to kind of re-articulate re those sounds. So I think that question you ask is gonna come much stronger in the last session where I'm gonna kind of like argue for a return to testimony um through sound um and so yeah i think we'll get there basically but um but yeah does that sort of somehow touch on what you're interested your, your question was asking yes thank you it's an open question so okay cool we keep it open <laughs>
Uh, so, I'd like to, I'd like yeah. to ask you to, could you, this is a, this is, could you go, could you expand a little bit on this idea, the truth, um, the, tr the truth value, like the, the, the way that you are contesting the value of truth. And then you spoke about truth is actually between something and something. I mean, uh, um, between what, uh, yeah, so uh, I'm just trying to get back to that. I, I find that. Uh, I think this well, is the core what you're trying to, to so, say here. Yeah. So, so what I'm saying is that what you're going to see throughout the four sessions is moments where the law isolates, in, this, in these cases, a sound, but you'll see it in many ways, from, its, in, from the means by which it resounds, right? And what I'm saying is that if you take the case of the accent analysis, where asylum seekers are rejected because of the way they pronounce certain words, it isolates their voice from the interlocutor, right? So often right. the interviewer is, say he's the guy's Palestinian, they're given an interviewer from Iraq, in from Iraq. So um, uh, that's just because in Europe they don't really care. They have this kind of ideology of monolingualism, right? Where they believe that if you're from a country, you speak a language. So then these two people negotiate how to speak across these kind of geographies and you end up with a specific quality of a voice, which is nothing to do with, if ever there is a voice that is connected with a kind of regional identity or a specific kind identity tied to a person, which I, I would contest anyway, I would say that the voice is like the least of all um, faithful, truthful things. I think it's the most slippery of all things. So I think um, what I'm saying there is exactly in that failure to see um, the, uh, the listener there and the sort of space between speaker and listener as a kind of thing that is manifesting the way that that person speaks, you are committing a kind of like failure to understand the ways in which sound works, the way in which we hear, the ways in which things touch on each other and the problems with kind of like creating these sort of forms of isolation. So we're going to see that in the, in, the, in the thing on the Syrian prison in terms of um, the senses, so across sound and sight, as a little bit like what I talked about before, like using the, this oscillation between sight and sound. And actually, when we talk about sound, we're never really talking about sound. And, and, and that's the way in, in which it's truth manifest. Um, but we're also going to see how like sound becomes a sort of stand-in for hunger, where whispers become a stand-in for kind of like violence. Mm. Uh, we're going to see in the third session the ways in which background noise, the relation between sort of like what is background and foreground is this sort of like contested sort of thing moving between those spaces is also a place in which truth is kind of derived. And the next session is, has much to do with kind of like voice and accent, as what I said. So in each of those cases, we're going to see means by which these kind of like singularities emerge and ways in which we could kind of like audibly contest them, audibly hear them, audibly um, think otherwise about what sound then means for the law and what the law and how the law is listening, right? And the problems with the legal listening to not only sound, but to our voices, to the way we're being heard generally, but also uh, the way that sound troubles the way that law produces its truth. Mm. Uh, or the, the way that sound shows us that thing. It's not only sound. Again, I never want to speak about the essential nature of sound. But uh, I use and think through sound. I find sound very useful to think through and arrive at those conclusions um, more than I'm making an argument for the, that it's only possible to do this through sound. Of course not. Mm. Mm. And there's another thing that uh, I want to just deal with uh, because, and this is the final thing I'm going to say, uh, because again, it sets up everything we're going to speak about in the next sessions. And this is what I would say, call this section like sort of like understanding what is between the right to silence and the freedom to speak. And again, that oscillation between those two things we're going to see throughout the session. So, Although listeners in the crowd 
of, um, uh, of the killing of Muhammad Abu Dahir had highly attuned hearing, they would never testify in an Israeli courtroom uh, and, use the legally, and use legally the audio expertise they have developed as occupied subjects. Right? The reasons for this are twofold. Firstly, because they do not recognize the laws and legal procedures of their colonizers. And secondly, because the Israelis would never consider these protesters as credible sources of testimony. As prosecutors of the state, their voices clearly occupy the wrong side of the legal threshold, outside of legal audibility, and inside the realm of political bias I previously discussed in the context of the trial I testified in the UK. This means that the inaudible sound of a gunshot that is itself suppressed is only immediately audible to those whose voices are silenced by both their own volition and by the refusal of the Israeli authorities to allow them to speak in court. Such a double silencing then, one as an act of resisting, resistance and one as an act of suppression simultaneously, necessitates a doubled act of listening, both physical and political. One that can allow sounds of the suppressed gunshots to be heard, as well as the forces that necessitate the suppression of their voices, right? So the sound and the suppression. A meeting of the two forms of audio scrutiny that of the law, who can testify, what, form of, what the form of testimony must take, and that of the reception of acoustic stimulus, what can physically or technologically be heard or perceived, and who can hear it, and who can have heard it. So this is then dedicated to the analysis of such moments, this, this project, where political forms of listening converge with physical and material conditions of sound. And no better example can introduce this idea than the sonically suppressed sound of a gunshot whose comprehensive analysis can amplify a political act of suppression, both willful and forced. So one of the main instances of this performance of a politically active moment of withdrawal or silence occurred when, unlike Nadim Nawara, Muhammad Abu Dahar was buried according to Islamic law on the day that he was killed, on the same day he was killed, he was buried, right? This meant that his body could not be subjected to a post-mortem examination. Um, and this became a hindrance to the forensic investi investigation on site, the state-led forensic investigation. So such acts of withdrawal are, however, often overlooked. They are seen as uniformed, un uninformed, or religiously conservative, rather than containing their own political message. The burial means, to me, because, I, because unlike Defense for Children International, who said, it's such a shame that they buried him because we could have derived something from that. To me, the burial means something else. It means that the already violated body does not become a subject to, to, to suspicion about how it was murdered. That Muhammad was shot by the Israeli soldier uh, and that was witnessed by a large crowd. So the material facts of the crime are seen as irrelevant by the family who view their son's death in the same lineage of colonial violence repeated over and over again since 1948. So, what I'm trying to say is, everybody saw that happen. The fact that I'm even doing this sonic analysis is ridiculous, because there's maybe 50 witnesses on the ground who just see someone being shot dead, and still the Israelis say, no, no, we shot rubber bullets. I don't know where that bullet came from. Maybe the Palestinians shot him. That's the argument, and they win. So, what I'm trying to say is, it seems ludicrous, forensics seems ludicrous in this condition. And that's what these people are saying by the immediate burial. Everyone saw it. If we subject ourselves to the forensic narrative, we are saying that these, um, uh, law, the, there is law here, right? Other than the fact that there is no law. People are shot dead without punity. So whether, so, so the withdrawal of their body can thus be seen rather than as an, uh, only an obedience to Sharia law, but as a consistent with the kind of Palestinian politics of silence in the face of representation, which has been happening since 1948, right? It's what was, of course, Edward Said talking about, right? And um, so, so you, you, could, you could summarize some of Said's arguments, something like this. Said doesn't want to speak for the silence or ignored. He thinks the Orientalists are already doing that, right? He wants the silence to be heard, right? So the story as a story concerns group or groups of people 
who are unable to represent themselves, not because they cannot speak or have no stories, and not because they have, not, they have been repressed, although that is often the case. It is not even chiefly a question of their access to the means of distribution of narrative, although that too is of course important. They cannot represent themselves, Said is saying, because they are already represented. So, Said wants silence to be heard of other forms of representation, essentially. Many strategies for listening to silence are going to be demonstrated in the next cases. Um, and so, how does this burial of the body perform this kind of silence, right? So in burying the body of Muhammad Abu Daha, this kind of like Saidian silence, which I also think is outdated. I'm going to get to why I think it's outdated, but let's stay, that, that's their politics, right? So in burying the body of Muhammad Abu Daha before an autopsy can be performed, the family performs the withdrawal of the corporal facts that could tell in a legal context the specific circumstances of his murder, right? So you actually just pull the bullet out and say like, that's the thing that killed him, right? It's not a rubber bullet. In doing so, they place their son's body in a metaphorical kind of like mass grave of colonial violence, right? So Abu Daher does not become a victim, but martyred body in a collective struggle for liberation. Abu Daher does not become an isolated body in a morgue waiting colonizer to investigate the subject of its own violence he is not made subject to the state's performative self-investigation uh, and therefore he is not instrumentalized in its broadcasting of colonial occupation as a civil and democratic project to European and American yeah. Americans don't really care whether it's democratic or not but Europeans still have this idea that they need to see Israel playing by the rules so by pulling the body out, you say, there's no possibility my son will show that this colon colonial project, this apartheid, is playing by the rules. He is not made subject to, to, to that. So, a similar tactic was performed multiple times in, re in, in the last July protest in East Jerusalem and the West Bank w against the installation of metal detectors at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. When three dead bodies were ki uh, killed during the, these protests, they were smuggled out of a uh, Jerusalem hospital and carried in white sheets over the wall, you know, the wall that separates Palestine and Israel, uh, or the wall that goes through, whatever, that wall, you know what it is. Or you don't, and you should know what it is, if you don't, but I'm sure you know what it is. And into the jurisdiction of Palestinian authorities. So they carry the bodies over, they stole them from hospitals, carry them over. Uh, in this case, as it may have been with Muhammad Abu Daha's body, this was done to prevent the Israeli Defense Forces from abducting the disappearing and disappearing the bodies, which has been going on for, for some time. So, uh, there was a, an article now which, uh, in Al Jazeera from 2017. It said, it is widely known that Israel employs the practice as a tactic for the leverage of negotiations. So in 2012, Israel released the bodies of 90 Palestinians in a gesture for reviving peace talks between Israeli and Palestinian officials. And between 2012 and 14, some 27 bodies were returned. So this kind of like keeping of the body as a kind of like card to play is a tactic also. So that's why the body, even after death, uh, the protesting body is a continued object of political contention, which Palestinian families of the abducted corps, corpses claimed is a strategy of psychological torture inflicted upon them by Israeli authorities. So again, sort of like, Again, also defiling uh, certain kinds of Sharia law, not burying them, you know, not allowing them to, to uh, participate in the, in the ritual. As such, even the intentions of a neutral observer to conduct an analysis of the dead body cannot remain neutral. Any post-mortem is a political intervention that can disturb the foundations upon which resistance to occupation is being fought. If even after death the body continues to struggle for liberation, then the space of post-mortem forensic examination cannot escape the politics of this situation and must proceed in a manner that exceeds the neutrality of science and conducts its investigation knowing the political message behind each of the incisions it makes into the body. 
Without his body to analyze the main piece of evidence we had in this murder is the sound of the shot that killed him. Yet, as we will see in greater detail next session, sound in medicine has long been a way for doctors to make a non-intrusive analysis of bodies. Just as doctors have learned to see inside the body by listening with a stethoscope uh, or by doing with an ultrasound, here the shot that killed Abu Dhahar is a sound that allows a non-intrusive analysis into his buried body, right? So in line with the, post, with the politics of post-mortem practice outlined above, forensic listening here represents both a corporally and politically non-intrusive way to reach some acknowledgement of his killing and advocate against such murders, while conducting a sound analysis of this gunshot we gain insight into the specific material facts surrounding his death while respecting the body's silence and the body's right to remain buried or to not be used in titles in negotiation. In analyzing the gunshot to, uh, to establish that it is not rubber bullet, but in fact live ammunition that has not been intentionally suppressed, to, to, uh, that has been intentionally suppressed to sound like a rubber bullet, we technically and forensically instantiate and advance the politics of Saeed. So we don't just sit with the kind of anti-representational politics, we advance it from a metaphorical listening to silence to analysis of silence itself, to analysis of the suppression, the, the kind of forces of, of suppression that a rubber bullet adapter exerts upon a bullet. So very literal. This means the investigation is very literally listening to and analyzing forms of silence and suppression. Where, where one important distinction lies in understanding the way rubber bullet adapter suppresses gunfire by comparing it to that of a silencer, right? The way a silencer suppresses it. So the missing frequencies, the negative sound, the proof of the effect of the rubber bullet adapter on live ammunition, and the, this in turn allows us to understand the use of rubber bullet adapter as a strategy used to conceal the crime itself. In this way, we do not need to disturb the body of Muhammad Abu Daher um, uh, um, to, to know how he was killed. This, as this is witnessed by all present, mostly the unheard witnesses of colonial occupation. However, legally speaking, we do need to be able to decode the sound to distill the fact of the murder that was per perpetrated, to distill the fact whether or not the murder was perpetrated intentionally. In listening to the attempt to silence the gunshot, the investigation remains focused on the representation of the violent act of murder before the shot hits his body. So through this non-corporally intrusive sound analysis, the focus on the investigation is on the perpetrator rather than speaking for or standing for the victim. The victim's politics is allowed to become manifest while we analyze or make a post-mortem of the shot as it leaves the chamber of the gun rather than when it hits or intrudes into his body. The circumstances of these deaths and the non-intrusive analysis of them via forensics of sound make clear the crucial link between physical and political listening. In this first instance, in order to comprehend the details of the murder, there is a necessity to listen to the material information of the sound recording and to physically hear how the live ammunition has been technologically suppressed and to some extent the presence of live ammunition silenced. But further, in this act of forensic listening, we engage, too, in a political listening, becoming conscious both of the colonial silencing of the Palestinian struggle and this community's own willful and resistant silence. So this meeting of these two kinds of um, silence, sorry, these two kinds of listening, surface various kinds of silence, represent the contemporary contribution of this project, of my work, to more well-rehearsed post-colonial arguments of Saeed, amongst others, on the importance of listening to rather than speaking for suppressed, right? Um, is there any questions here? Okay, I'll go, I'll just uh, wrap up. So, what complicates the technically instantiated forms of listening to silence and the anti-representational politics of Said, however, 
is that we cannot arrive at these material conclusions or fully understand the significance of the withdrawal performed by uh, Abu Dahl's family to bury the body without having had access to the autopsy of Nadim Nawara. So, for just as it is bold political claim for Abu Dahl's family to withdraw his body, it was equally bold for Siam Nawara, Nadim's father, to pursue the material facts of the investigation at all costs, including subjecting his son's body to an autopsy by the Israeli authorities responsible for investigating crimes committed by the military. For although Muhammad Abu Dahar's murder was never formally investigated and no one was charged with his killing, it was only possible for local NGO uh, Defense Fiction International to bring advocacy and awareness to his murder because of the autopsy of Nadim Nawara's body, which confirmed that Nadim Nawara was killed by live round. So they pulled the bullet out of his body, right? Still didn't amount to anything. But we had then the patient zero, if you want, in this epidemic. With the autopsy diagnosis of Nawara's death being the result of live fire, I was then able to analyze the sound of the shot that killed Nawara knowing that the sound of live fire suppressed by a rubber bullet adapter. So I knew we had the patient zero. What we needed was to look at how this shot behaved acoustically in comparison to rubber bullets fired on the same day that were recorded by the same microphones. And in this sense, Noara became the patient zero in a diagnosis of the strategy of murder, which not only took his life, but also claimed Muhammad Abu Doha's life and wounded Muhammad Abu Az Azze on the same day, and the crowd reactions from the crowd reaction, we can say, also likely killed and injured many others while the cameras were not so proximate. But the physical evidence of Noir's autopsy enabled me to correctly hear the sound of suppressed live fire, or rather to understand what I was hearing, uh, what I was looking for. The corporeal evidence uh, of one case augmented the auditory evidence of the other. So the autopsy augmented the possibility to be able to use sound in the investigation of the other. So here intrusive and non-intrusive analyses sit side by side, forms of silencing and suppression behind the sound of lethal live rounds that would have remained inaudible, drowned out by the loud blast, if it were not for the will of Nadim Nawara's family to allow his body to speak or to be to, to be represented by, by Israeli uh, investigators. In this investigation, it proved necessary on the one hand to listen to silences and to amplify them on the, to the level of speech, and on the other hand, to resort to forms of speech that are readily available in the comprised legal forms that police the truth, the compromised legal forms that police the truth. This is what Siam Nawara did, even though it is clear that he, the hearing he received is humiliating, it is unjust, its verdicts and, uh, were totally politically compromising for him, uh, and they set within the parameters of the colonial state, right? So he's essentially humiliated, right? Because he puts his son's body to post-mortem, and they come back and say, oh, this is negligence, the guy didn't mean to fire live ammunition, it was an accident. Imagine, that's humiliating. But still, he persists. He says it's still important to know the truth. It doesn't matter the, the narrative. It doesn't matter the way that I will be humiliated also by my Palestinian uh, fellows who claim that I'm collaborating with the Israelis, with the occupiers, for even uh, uh, subjecting my son's body. Or for other people who say, you're an idiot. Your, body, your son's body is going to be abducted. You're not going to see him until the next prisoner swap, right? You're going to have the body. It's going to be in a morgue. So navigating this duality between the strategies of the families of Nawara and Abu Dahab, between a withdrawal and a revelation, between silence and speech, delineates the diagram of all the cases I'm going to speak about in the next session. And that's why it serves as an introduction. For it is repeatedly the task here to listen to silences or suppressions, to amplify the inaudible, and in doing so to refuse silence as such, so not to do, not to be Saidian and to and to accept the refusal, but to to accept silence as the end goal, but to refuse it also. 
To use the space of forensic analysis as a means to navigate between representational and anti-representational politics by amplifying negative sound and in doing so to advocate for the crimes of the unheard without, without negating the use of silence as a political strategy. By now it should be clear that these separate modes of hearing silence, both materially and politically, are entangled. One pejorative of this work is how to make a parent kind of hearing affects the other, how to understand the influences of one type of hearing on the other, and identifying pathways between material and political acts of listening. And that's what I believe makes the work of forensic audio analysis political. So I spot the ways in which forensic listening can supplement Saeed's politics of refusal to provide an additional listens that does not stop or become satisfied with political silence and withdrawal, but in multiple circumstances demonstrated, that I will demonstrate, can submit silence and suppress sound as material evidence itself. Evidence that can remain within the threshold of legal audibility while also crossing into the terrain that is legally silent, that of collective political claims that law courts are simply not adapted to hear. So through this double act of listening to suppression, the analysis of a silence gunshot can become a form of listening to and documenting collective silence. So that's where I'm ending my big introduction into these ideas. Um, I would love to hear from you. We have half an hour left of this session. Um, yeah. Comments, questions. Um, I had a super quick, like, there's a question. Uh, I was wondering if the option of silence uh, of Said was in the big Orientalism volume or in some other work or essay. Um, he, it's where it's, it's so it, it, if you, if you want to get like a quick access to that. Uh, there's a book called Children of Silence by someone called Michael Wood, which is a, very much about um, kind of post-colonial anti-representational politics. Mm -hmm. Thanks. But I don't know exactly where it is. Okay. No, that's and, thank you. Yeah. and I would feel bad for you if you're now going back to Orientalism by Edward Said. That would just be shame <laughs> for your time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I recognize also I uh, spoke a lot. The next sessions will be more dis discursive, and I want to make sure that in the next session uh, there's a presentation both on the text, kind of having imbued all this stuff that I've been talking about. I would like someone to present the text by um, uh, uh, sorry, Rosalind Morris um, next week. Plus, I think what would be useful is a short presentation by someone else on uh, the politics of voice by Mladen Dola, which I'm going to send over. Because next week we're going to be totally talking about forensic linguistics and the voice. So, um, so two presentations. One that serves as a kind of recap from this session using the Rosalind Morris text, and another that talks about politics of voice by Mladen Dola. So th those should be 15 minutes each. So who would like to do that? No, sir, I'm happy to do the politics of voice. Great. Okay. Um, who wants to do the Rosalind Morris? Someone got to do it. Didn't speak to anyone? No one liked that text? No one was inspired by it? I can do it. Okay. Maybe I can love it. You know when Google puts that I could do that? Did you type that? Or did you set it and it made the... 
pop up. Wait, no, that's yeah. up. <laughs> you typed it, right? Ah, that's Livia. Yeah, I, I, I typed it, but as somebody else, uh, yeah. Okay. I just want to know how this thing works because it's kind of amazing. Okay. Yeah, an, an auto dictation app for this class would actually. It's, be it's, it's okay. Yeah, I'll do the next one. Livia can do it. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, I, I I can do a next thing. I can do a next thing. Uh, uh, yeah. This is a lot. Um, I just wanted to. Uh, you're muted. Sorry. It's, it's a lot of information that we got from you. And I suppose that maybe some of that writing from what you were reading or you had your notes, um, is it possible to get any of those notes for us or or to look into that through your thesis? Or I suppose yeah. that the thesis is available, some of this information. I mean, it's just, it's just really, really rich. Yes, sure, sure. I recognize that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send over some of that um, as a kind of like recap thing. Nice. Or maybe even Flavio, you could do that. Kind of like specific uh, passages uh, of the the PDF you sent us. No, uh, of uh, the PDF I'm going to send you. That's basically. Oh. Yeah, maybe uh, I can do it. But it depends if anybody wants to do uh, to do that. I think um, like if Lauren sends it, but if everything is just always posted to the Google Classroom, that keeps everything in one spot. Another class used the Google Drive for like when there was a massive amount of PDFs. So I don't know how many PDFs you're going to be using for the class, but if it's just four sessions and like one per class, things can just be posted to the uh, classroom. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to do more than that. Yeah. Okay, maybe I have like some other things to do in the in this period, but I can give it a watch and maybe I can write something if 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 this class needs it. No, I, I don't think he was suggesting that you like watch something and write it down. I think he was saying about giving you notes or something, right? I was saying that, yeah, if, if you could distribute the, the notes, basically, you know, what I was reading from, if, you, if, you, if it was hard to follow or if you need an, another time to reflect on it, I can send those over. It's not a problem. OK. I mean, we all generally write notes during these classes anyway, so anyone who wants to post their own notes to the classroom, I mean, it's kind of a, there's no limit to stuff you can put up there, so. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's, it's better, than, better than just uploading this again. Why not you tell me what spoke to you or what you needed more clarification from, and I can just pull those bits out, you know? That's probably the best thing. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense because, like, I mean, particularly, like, like the brief mention you gave to, like, um, yeah, dubbing by of actors um, on, like, um, BBC that, like, Thatcher brought in the uh, broadcast band, like, that in particular, particular, and, like, just the politics of the North are, of, of Ireland are very interesting to me. So, like, I'd have a take on something to do with that. And that's, you know, so, yeah, if people post well, their own notes to the class, it's always better, you know. You know, actually, um, Terence, then how about you? Um, kind of like, let me just think about this, because why not through the politics of the voice, through that text, actually talk about that broadcast ban? Because I think you, that, oh, yeah, I, I don't really talk about that, that's why I jumped on it. Yeah, because that would be great, that would be perfect, because I think all manner of things are interesting then. I can send, there's a clip I can send you of of the actors doing it and stuff like that. Oh, you, you'll find it on YouTube. Yeah, one of them was one of them was uh, Connor Grimes. I know that. Exactly, yeah, yeah. He's kind of like famous, right? He was in uh, V for Vendetta. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, the funny, like, even like some of the things you read about that is like, as absurd as that was for like out of work actors, which there's plenty of in Northern Ireland, is like, oh wow, we've got some really interesting work to do now. Like without thinking of like political ramifications or anything like that, you know? Definitely. No, the, the politics of, of, no, I think actually each one of them chose a different kind of way to utter it. Some of them chose to just behave as if it was CJ Adams talking. Some behaved as if they wanted to show how rid ridiculous the overdubbing was. So they. Absolutely. Kinda, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, I, I mean, I'm not sure if anyone has actually tried to like look over 
back over that stuff from like an art historical point of view because like it is obviously it's, it's very rich for analysis like particularly like there's all, i mean like artists in northern ireland are often overlooked but like even the history of performance art in northern ireland is really really interesting because there was all this really 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 intensely countercultural things going on that's you know not really pe many people know about so yeah well that would be great to hear yeah through through if 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 you can tie it through the politics of the voice which i'm sure you'll be able to do i think that would be amazing i think that's I mean, that's something that like was a clear point in the end of the video that we watched for the class is that you know at the end of it um you know you this thing you know, people speaking and it's inaudible and uh someone said i'm not sure who it is exactly who says it but I think that their hearing abilities are perfectly fine to the judge, you know, who's asking these people to speak. Can they hear me? Yeah. 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 I think they can hear you. Yeah, yeah that was it. Yeah, that, 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 that was like almost darkly humorous. I don't know. It was, it was like, there's definitely an absurdity to it there. Yeah. Right. Sorry, I'm not sure if in the video all the names of the. Um witness witness family were included in your video um I, yes uh yeah they're all included yeah included. okay i'll take a better look i have a i have a interest I, I would like to uh look also i mean there are many points here that i that i find re really uh you know pertinent to what i'm my research is about but particularly i heard you talk briefly very briefly passing through this idea of the psychological torture that the disappeared body of um, the victims uh, does to the, the rest of the people, uh, yeah. the families, etc. And it was just touched well, upon really, they, really they quickly. So that, that, yeah, and the body becomes a site of contesting the disappeared body. But um, is there any ref I have one text about this, of the, the extent of the... Um, the impact of the disappear body, how it also is a psychological torture. I mean, I'm sorry, of, um, of intense fear, right? Of creating terror. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any other texts that you could recommend around that. On disappearance? Well, um, you spoke about the psychological torture that this, um, the, the implications of that. I mean, it's a strategy to create a psychological torture within yeah. the population. Yeah, and, you know, there and was I wonder a, if you have. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There was an article in Al Jazeera that was all all about this tactic of abducting bodies, and it had like all the numbers and the facts and interviews with with some of the family. Okay. Yeah, but it's very important distinction between abducted and disappeared. Right. Right, because you know where they are, you know who has them. Disappeared is another kind of torture in which, of course, you you play on the fact you don't know. I think they're two very different kinds of psychological torture. That, yeah. So, um, yeah. Oh, wait, you're muted. Can we have, uh, can we have access to that, Al Jazeera? Ah, uh, so Terence just. Oh, right there it is. Great. Thanks. Okay. Could I ask a question before we stop? Yes, sure. Thanks. I'm thinking about um, how did you approach the the kind of technical demands of what you had to do? So I'm thinking of um, knowing whether or not the information you could show visually about the sound was sufficient to kind of back up the argument you were making. And well, I suppose because of this difficulty about separating the um the form and the content or the source and the context whatever yeah. the kind of vocabulary we talk about it but the thing and the manner in which it's recorded could you say uh, a bit about that yeah i mean um you can see all the technical breakdown of the audio investigation here i'm going to send the link now um i, I thought it was important that you uh, see the video first. Um, so here, yeah. sure. so you have each of the different forms of analysis that we use in this case. So where do I send this link now? I type I it. Think there's a chat. Ah yes. Um, if you no, no, no. 
Yeah, so like when you when you post something in the chat box here, the chat box is posted to the classroom afterwards. So like it's not it won't be like a nice like like formulaic bibliography, like nice structure thing, but at least all information's there and it's posted to the classroom. Okay, but where do I type this? Oh, I see. Amazing. Yes, yes. Okay. Um Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so you, you can see all that there, which you can like take time with and 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 see. But essentially, it's it's corroborating between various things, right? It's not only the sound. The sound was key in uh, Muhammad Abu Daha's death because of the ways in which we've seen it emerge across a pattern of visual spatial analysis in Nadim Nawara's death and bodily analysis, you know, the the post mortem. So all those things kind of corroborated a narrative. But because we had essentially one camera filming the whole time, we had kind of like test source. You know, you had every different, you had gas, you, had, you saw them firing um, gas canisters, tear gas, you saw them firing rubber bullets, and then there was this third sound, right? So what is that sound that became very apparent? They had a different acoustic signature to the others. Um, and from there, you, and adding to the corroboration of the elements, you, you could start to build that narrative. So, um, so that was kind of a, a lot on the luck of there being this continuation of footage. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's what's interesting, because like I say, this is not an isolated incident, right? That's, that's all we can say from the crowd reaction thing. So it's just that this day, cameras were filming. Um, and multiple cameras, and we could see the cameras, and there was photographers, and it was very kind of like well documented, right? So, um, uh, so all those things were able to be captured um, finally. Yeah. Um, I have a quick, quick, quick question, comment. Um, you had mentioned earlier sort of like your history of trying to interface with some like mid centuries um, listening techniques. Um, like I, I'm interested in how, say, like the like legacy of like someone like Pauline Oliveros, where it has this maybe not so virtuous um, goal of a sort of apolitical listening, and it tries to like always approach that asymptotically. Um, how how does that influence your ability to say and you might maybe talk about this next class I mean, it seems, I mean, like, it, it seems probably, like it relates to code switching but um yeah how it relates to how you sort of prep information for a courtroom to make sure that it's actually sort of optimized for the atmosphere uh yeah i mean essentially i'm going to go into that properly I think I mean something a bit different than what you took from it when I said that, but um, essentially I started this whole project being extremely frustrated with kind of a material discussion on sound, right? So like, you know, in the mid 2000s when the university reading and first thing in these things, I found no friends among sound studies, right? Because it was all like, sound is, is ephemeral, sound is immaterial, sound right. is, <laughs> you just, you just essentialize it. Like you cannot shut your ears, you can only shut your eyes. Everything I've come across proves that you can shut your ears pretty well. You can, sound is definitely material. <laughs> sound is definitely not ephemeral in many ways. Like if, and uh, I'm thinking also of certain kind of latent sounds we're gonna hear in the last piece. So. This whole thing kind of emerged in conflict or in tension with a lot of kind of sound studies. And that meant that people like Pauline Oliveros didn't really enter my logic because it, 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 it was more a kind of phenomenological approach, right? Um, however, you're gonna see the whole journey because in the last uh, session, I'm almost arguing for a kind of um, uh, material phenomenology, or a kind of like a forensic phenomenology, mm. um, through my experience interviewing these uh, prisoners. 
so uh, so it's, it's somehow kind of like come back to that in a weird way uh, not not all the mistakes of that kind of like era but just definitely to someone like Pauline Oliveros who actually I think is kind of like you know it, it's interesting I mean it's interesting that deep listening in many ways is the opposite of forensic listening <laughs> It, it should be kind of like similar in a way, right? You, yeah, you'd think they would be similar, but yeah. <laughs> quite the opposite. Yeah. No, um, but I, I, I think there's something we can, we can, we can come back to on that discussion, like in the last session. But yeah, we'll have to suspend it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And talking about the, the next session, even that you already mentioned uh, some of the readings that you proposed. Yes. And yes. just for the sake of clarity, could you please post on the on the group chat the list of readings for next session? Yes, sure. Yes, sure. I'll send. Uh, I'll send. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Since we we have to stop in like eight nine minutes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. You want me to do it now? Yeah, I'm do it now. Mm, I don't. I don't know. Like before lesson ends. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. Bon. So should we finish for today and uh, meet next week? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, bye, Flavio. Bye, Flavio. Right. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to remind you of the, the sorry.